And I think it's largely when you see new technologies, new tools uh, for the left hemisphere to play with, you get this sort of switch towards a, a left hemisphere dominance in a culture, in music, in art. And I think we're seeing that today. Hey there, James here, and you're listening to the Own the Moment podcast, the show where we explore the complex and always evolving landscape of marketing, advertising, and branding, and try to get to the bottom of what it means to be a truly memorable brand. The Own the Moment podcast is brought to you by Como Technologies, a self-service, complete customer engagement platform that helps you cut through the noise to truly connect with your customers and retain and grow those connections over time. With Como, you can build and deploy new campaigns, activations, promotions, and programs in days, not months. And our software is used by some of the world's biggest consumer brands from Heineken to Budget, Goodman Fielder, Foxtel, JLL, Williams Racing, and McDonald's. Learn more at como.tech. This week's guest is Orlando Wood, the Chief Innovation Officer at System One and author of two must-read books for marketers, Lemon and Look Out. If you've ever wondered why TV ads don't feel as memorable or fun today as they did in the 90s, well, Orlando can tell you why. Orlando's two books, Lemon and Look Out, employ a unique mix of neuroscience, cultural history, and advertising research, and explore how an increase in left brain thinking has spread like wildfire across marketing and business, and argues in a very compelling way that this is to blame for the huge decline in advertising effectiveness over the past 15 years. Orlando and I had a great discussion about the crisis of creativity, why truly great advertising today is so rare, and most importantly, what marketers, creatives, and advertisers can do to reverse the trend and build effective and engaging campaigns. Let's get to the show. Orlando Wood, thanks for being on the show. Great to be here, James. So um, I found this quote from you, Orlando, that was, we're in a golden age for advertising technology, but far from a golden age for advertising creativity. And I've heard you say we're in a crisis of creativity. So let's start there. Tell me what's, what's going on. Yes. Well, that's actually on the front cover of my book, Lemon, isn't it? Um, and I think it encapsulates really probably the, the thinking in both my books, Lemon and Look Out. And I describe in both of them how in this digital age, uh, there have been enormous changes, not just uh, in in advertising, but in culture. And a shift, particularly in advertising, towards a different style of of, of ad that is uh, really not so good at lodging the brand in memory, holding, capturing attention, uh, and eliciting an emotional response. All the things needed for lasting effects, for share gain, profit gain, reducing price sensitivity, all the things that um, you know that that we should be concerned about uh, as marketeers. And you know, we as what often happens is you you know in times of technological change, we spend an awful lot of time looking at the new tool and trying to get to grips with it. And uh, you know, this this changes our our ways of thinking, our habits of thinking, and we can become a little bit more linear in the way that we think. And we lose some of the craft that uh, went before because you sort of the it becomes an industry. What was a a craft profession really becomes an industry um, and you know you end up sort of concerned with the quantity of output um, and less on the quality of the output and that's I think probably what what has happened to some extent mm. uh, it's, in, it's in interesting I had group. Jamie Pete on from uh, McCann oh, yes. who has done a lot of work with Aldi and you know he, he yeah. made the same observation the other day which was you know this was going back in time you know a, a you know a craftsperson's Mm. Um, industry and it's become much more of a commodity. So, you know, we're going to dig into, and I, I, of course, deeply recommend everyone go and read Lemon and Look Out. We're going to dig into this idea of left versus right brain advertising. But before we do that, you know, so, you know, why does this matter? So you say, you know, you say there that the advertising is not as good. You know, how do we know it's not as good? What do we mean by not as good? Um, and, yeah. and how do we, ha- you know, how can we see that this is happening? For those that yeah. are maybe not sort of deep in the advertising of course, sector. Of course. Well, look, there, there are probably, you know, have been for a 
probably a hundred years, two schools of advertising, one that is concerned with, um, I suppose, achieving direct sales uh, in the near and short term future, uh, one that is more targeted. Um, and uh, then there's the other type, which is sort of broader, more general, um, that seeks to, you know, create uh, lasting effects um, on people who may not be in the market right now, but might be in the future. Um, and what we see, and there are different ways of measuring, of course, the results of advertising and those two types of advertising. And what uh, my starting point really for Lemon was Peter Field's analysis of the IPA's effectiveness database. And he looked at the ability of uh, advertising to create market share gain relative to the amount that was invested in it. So a brand's share of voice or excess share of voice, which usually translates into market share gains if you're spending more than your size relative to your competition. And he, through a, a long analysis over years, um, showed that advertising was was create was less able to create these lasting effects, this market share gain. You know, from a, starting around probably around two thousand and six, two thousand eight, that sort of time. And uh, this was sort of getting things were getting worse and worse, and that uh, shows that. You know, this second type of advertising, which is actually the more important type of advertising, this broad, general kind of advertising, was not doing the job that it needed to be doing. Um, whilst at the same time, you know, he also observed that we're uh, spending more and more of our budgets on and our objective setting actually is becoming more and more short term Um so, so it's the, a sort of switch a, away from the broad and uh, general towards the narrow and the um, specific and the targeted. And the thing is that that second type of advertising works better. In fact, it really needs the first kind of this, this brand building, you know, as we historically have called it, this general broad kind of advertising for it to work at its very best. Um, and we're focusing more and more on the narrow type, and that's the, that's the problem, and uh, that means that you know it is very difficult for, um, for to see to see you know sustained um, growth. So that's um, that's that's kind of what the starting point. It was Peter's analysis uh, of it all, and then of course uh, with, in Lemon, I look at the sort of style the the aesthetic if you like of advertising over 30 years or so and show that there was this change in advertising style pretty much at the time that peter starts to notice that effectiveness uh, is falling and uh, there was a shift away from advertising that seeks to entertain that has narrative that has music um, that uh, might have metaphor and humor towards a sort of advertising that was pretty direct in its style, quite mechanistic towards advertising that, um, you know, is pretty flat and has uh, words on the screen and is sort of short, sharp cuts, that kind of thing, very rhythmic as well in the way it looks and sounds, and dislocated from time and place. And that uh, that shift, you know, happens around that, that same time. And indeed, when you look at the relationship between, as I do in my second book, Look Out, these two styles of advertising, you see that this broader, more general advertising with narrative, metaphor, uh, you know, music, people connecting in it, something happening, you know, in front of us, that's much better at generating these broad and lasting effects and that this this sort of more mechanistic and linear um, flat you know words on the screen rhythmic type advertising um, if it works at all is is best is better um, at generating these sort of short term effects directing people to a website you know who are probably already in the buying window 
who are already open and receptive to the category, you know, uh, or, or taking them to an app or, you know, that kind of thing. So uh, these two styles of advertising work in different ways. They, they should be measured in different ways. And, um, you know, we're kind of, uh, we've, we've neglected the more important type over the last 15 years or so. Yeah. And, and so, you know, what is it that you think, I mean, I mean, the obvious, I was going to ask, so, you know, what, what happens in around 2006 um, that causes this change? I mean, obviously one's mind goes to sort of the rise of programmatic advertising and of course, social media. Is there anything else for those who haven't read the book that they should, is there anything else that happens around that time that you think could be sort of one of the yeah well there there are lots of things uh going on at the time um and you know you mentioned a a few of them there i mean we were becoming increasingly digital at that time uh to the point that it was actually quite difficult to do the analysis because Prior to that, in digital records didn't exist, you know, um, right. for, 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 you know, the kind of um, just looking at the types of ads that, you know, were out there. Um, and so you, you, you get a lot of things happening. There were a lot of mergers and acquisitions, you know, it was a time of bigness, um, you know, and uh, there was also, you know, advertising, I think, was becoming more global. Um, so an ad sort of had to work everywhere. Something that that that, that, that of course digital technology can, it sort of enables you to to do, um, and therefore an ad that works everywhere sort of but it doesn't often you know as I often say it doesn't doesn't tend to work anywhere necessarily particularly well because it can't tap into local cult- culture and nuance, and also you get this uh, with te- with technology of course. Um, it becomes in some ways easier to create certain kinds of ad and uh you know and also it means that you can you know suddenly we can cut these ads up into smaller parts re-edit them put them somewhere else and that that takes you to a certain style of advertising that's quite different from you know uh say a, a you know a, a kind of a, almost like a comedy sketch that an, unfolds in front of you you know with people acting you can't cut that up so easily into smaller parts and everything just becomes a bit more direct you know um and it's not you know but it's not just in advertising you see these shifts as i show in both books you know you see you see a more literal linear and uh direct kind of entertainment being made in this period and a move away from things that show people connecting in a place, you know, with fewer sitcoms being made. Uh, you see, you know, the sorts of film that are being made, fewer romance and comedies. Um, you know, you, you've got a, a shift, a general shift in culture as a result of this new technology. That, I mean, that's just absolutely fascinating to think about, you know, beyond advertising things like right sitcoms and rom-coms etc yeah. so be- before we go any further why don't we just set up some basic definitions because you know <clears throat> as you've been speaking there you've been sort of i guess juxtaposing these these two types of um these two types of advertising which i know of course map to this concept of sort of left brain versus right mm-hmm. brain why don't you give mm-hmm. us a, a quick overview of of that and i know that has very much been inspired by um someone else that you've been following but yes. just just for the the listeners and the and the viewers sort of you know, of you know what are the sides of the brain and i guess you know yeah um, so anyone listening might be thinking well this left brain right brain thing hasn't that been debunked you know it's uh right uh, you know that the two halves of the brain might do different things well the, the the fact that they might do different things i think has rightly been debunked but what i uh, do is I follow the work of a brilliant uh, psychiatrist, neuroscientist, um, and indeed uh, a, a philosopher, you could say, um, called Ian McGilchrist. And Ian McGilchrist is uh, perhaps the world's expert on brain lateralization and how the two halves of the brain, the two hemispheres, pay attention to the world. And so Ian um, reframes the question and he says, well, it's not that they do different things, it's that they do things differently. They have different takes on the world, different priorities, different different modes of attention. And so uh, he describes um, 
how, in fact, the two hemispheres are quite different in the way that, you know, they're as- the brain is asymmetrical. The right brain is slightly heavier, slightly bigger than the left hemisphere. Um, that uh, they are um, they respond differently to different sorts of drugs and hormones. Uh, the right brain's got more white matter, you know, which speeds communication. The left brain priorities, prioritizes communication within localized brain regions. So you know, there are different there are quite differences which suggest a different style of, of, of attention. And uh, not just in people, but in other mammals and indeed in birds. And uh, what he sort of describes is that the the left hemisphere is very narrow in its attentional field. It brings a kind of narrow beam attention to things, whereas the right hemisphere um, brings a kind of broad beam attention. Um, it understands context, it understands the whole, it understands the world around it. It's there, it's there you know, whilst the left hemisphere is trying to identify what it can eat and close up and you know categorize it and uh, and say yeah this is okay um the right hemisphere is looking around it all the time making sure that we don't become someone else's lunch you know it's got it's a very different kind of attention it's this broad beam attention as opposed to this narrow beam attention of the left hemisphere but it doesn't really stop there because the left hemisphere as well as being you know sort of narrow beam it's very goal orientated it's very um uh, it likes to categorize things uh, to, uh, and people, you know, to identify them. Um, uh, categorization is usually a, a means to an end to control um, and manipulate the world around you so that, you know, you, 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 and it's kind of, I guess, you know, a helpful mechanism in many ways uh, for us. But, you know, the left brain likes things that are familiar. Oh, it's one of those, you know, is kind of how it how it thinks. And it's quite rigid and quite fixed in its thinking. And it can't really understand uh, music, metaphor, humor. Um, it's like it can't see things in depth. So it's very it tends to flatten things almost like a map, you know, so it produces right. a kind of shorthand symbol or a sign rather than a, um, you know, understanding the thing in all its uniqueness. And it's, um, it's also, uh, you know, it it can understand sort of basic rhythm, but not much more than that. So, uh, and it's also usually the side of the brain that deals principally with language. And uh, it likes tools and things with which to manipulate the world and language and signs and symbols, you know, are sort of chief of these things. It's also got a very high sense of its own importance, um, funnily enough. And it's, um, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't really, uh, it, there's no room for ambiguity. It can't bear risk. It can't, you know, any of those things. And it's often overly optimistic as well, um, pretty dogmatic. So so that's kind of the left hemisphere. It feels like a character assassination, but that's kind of, <laughs> kind of, uh, what, what it, what it, what, how it sort of operates. Um, but, but the right hemisphere, which presents the world to us in the first place and connects us with the world and, and, and connects us with the people in it and, you know, grounds us in the world really is very different. So it, it's got this broad beam attention. It understands context. It can understand, it understands people, their intonation, their accents, emotional expression. It's responsible for emotional expression as well. Um, and uh, largely, and it has this um, uh, ability to understand that, you know, two opposing thoughts could both be true at the same time. So it sort of understands things on two levels. So it understands metaphor, it understands the humor, uh, underst- you know, whereas the left hemisphere, you know, will think that a joke is a lie. The, the right hemisphere understands that it's a joke. Um you know, the right hemisphere it gives us our sense of space, depth, live time. Um, uh, it, it gives us, um, you know, our appreciation of, of music as well and flow, you know, things that move and change rather than, you know, like train tracks, you know, short, sharp, now this, now this, now this, now this, now this. So so you've got a very different way of perceiving the world, really, through the, the, the two hemispheres. And that, of course, brings into being a very different world for us. And 
uh, what what you find is that you know, uh, as I try to describe in the books, is that that in certain times in history, you get this, and I think it's largely when you see new technologies, uh, okay. you know, emerging, new tools uh, for the left hemisphere to play with. Um, you get this sort of s- slight sort of, well, this s- switch towards a, a left hemisphere dominance in a culture. Um, and, you know, oh, by the way, anger lateralizes to the left hemisphere too. And so you get this sort of shift um, in culture, in music, in art. Um, and I think we're seeing that today. And and we're certainly seeing it in the types of features that you see in advertising. You m- may have noticed as I was talking that you know the sorts of features I was talking about in advertising these short sharp cuts um this uh so lack of you know narrative lack of a sense of place and time and move away from people doing things you know in a in a scene with each other towards this sort of rigidity and if you see people at all it's just their hands or a staring blank face um, you know, you, you see this move towards a devitalized kind of advertising, one that's more me- mechanistic, more rhythmic, um, all, all the sorts of features that are, you know, you, you sort of expect to see in a, uh, you know, in, in a sort of left brain appreciation of the world. Mm. So <clears throat> perhaps a really silly question, but why is it then that, you know, because so that was a brilliant summary of sort of the left and versus the right. And I think everyone listening and watching sort of can instinctively just, you know, think back to advertising and sort of, um, right, this very flat, devitalized, very much shapes and rhythmic. And I think, you know, that very much feels like the sort of the, the current moment in advertising, I guess, particularly online. And maybe people can think back mm. to, at least for me, if I think back to the, you know, the great Australian beer ads of the 90s, very sort of very narrative, yeah. um, very sense of yeah. place, um, yeah. very sort of culturally, um, you know, whether it's accents Redmond. or, yeah. you know, yeah. regional sort of ideas. I think everyone can sort of see that. Why is it then, you know, because thinking how I should phrase this question why is one more effective than the other so I totally get the difference um but why is it that we you know feel more affinity and you know have stronger sort of emotional resonance to right brain Mm -hmm. advertising given you know as you've laid that up they're very different but you know aren't we rational why would not very cold yet very factual logical why does that not stick with us well, what I try to show in the books is that um, these two ways of paying attention to the world actually mirror the two types, the two schools of advertising that I described a few minutes ago, that um, for for this sort of broad and general advertising that um, lodges brands in memory and that, that you know, um, works by being interesting, actually, by creating interest in the brand or product, Actually, for this, you need a kind. You need to think about capturing and sustaining broad beam attention, and that for the other type of advertising that's sort of more narrowly targeted, you might want to think more about kind of narrow beam attention, um, because that's probably really the job there is to remind people who already know about you about the about the product. Um, you know, people who are probably in the buying window right now. And that's that. That's sort of the idea uh, that I expand on in Look Out, and I show how advertising that has these right brain features of dialogue and narrative and people and characters, um, humor, metaphor, and all these sorts of things, uh, music. The, these are the things that uh, elicit an emotional response that capture and sustain attention that lodge a brand in memory, actually, um, that create trust, that create esteem for a brand, um, you know, that essentially treat the audience with some intelligence and, um, you know, get the audience to do some of the job. That is to say, you present something to the audience and they read the context in the ad and they put some of the pieces together in their own minds and and make a connection with the ad, with the brand, and lodge it in memory. Whereas the uh, left hemisphere advertising I've been talking about, you know, it's sort of, it's kind of very direct. It's me at you. It's look at my product. It's like throwing up a product brochure at people. Um, 
and uh, that that will only work if you're vaguely interested in buying I don't know whatever it is a new sofa at that moment you know um, so and it will probably only work if, if if you've already heard of the brand in the first place you know I mean you maybe you'll consider it if you haven't but you know it will work better if you've heard of the brand in the first place through the other type of advertising yeah that's so so that's yeah nice. so I overlay these these features on effectiveness data and show um, just how important these right brain features are in advertising for for growth really so so um, I've seen online you've been sort of in some talks that you've given saying that you yeah. know per perhaps we're at you know, a turning point. Um, tell me, where do you think this goes? You know, do you think the industry has the ability to swing back towards, you know, maybe embracing the craft back towards right brain advertising? And, you know, in that, you know, you talked about technology shifts and I think 06 is such an interesting year because it's, of course, it's that, right, it's that, I guess, true digital mainstream mm -hmm. adoption and social media. Mm -hmm. Where do you think AI um, and some oh, of this generative stuff that's coming out. How, how do you think that maybe plays against a potential turning point? Yes. Where do things well, go take, from here? Take the first one first. Where are we now? Um, well, I'd like to think that we're at a turning point and, and maybe that, you know, now everyone's back together after COVID and everything, that things are, you know, we're back on the right track and we're, we're together again. But I think it's probably a little bit too early to put the bunting out, to put the flags out uh, yet. Um, and, uh, you know, Peter's continued assessment from the, um, from the IPA's effectiveness data suggests not really much improvement um, uh, in, in, in the most recent data he was, he was telling me about. Um, so it's not, it's not, uh, you know, I think we're, we're still some way off. And certainly when you look at advertising, a lot of advertising that you, particularly on TV, you know, TV, you'd expect, um, to be a, a narrative, right. audio visual, you know, uh, humorous kind of entertainment, um, channel for advertising. And, and it's still very much, a lot of it looks very much like this this sort of narrow beam advertising that that has been learned i think from uh, online environments from online platforms from social media um if I, I have some evidence to suggest that in look out in fact looking at the styles of advertising across these different different channels and platforms so um yeah, a bit, bit too early, I would say, to put the flags out. But, um, you know, I, I think we, we, there, there is um, a, a growing feeling that uh, amongst marketeers that I speak to, that it would be wonderful if we could bring some of this craft back because it is more effective, more memorable. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying this, but so John Hegarty said to me, you know, I'm sure it'll come back, you know, because it works. It just takes, it will just take time, you know. And um, yeah, well, I'm, hope, I'm, I'm hoping to provide the evidence for that, for that kind of route and that, that shift back again. Yeah. And I think if nothing else, I mean, I think the success of, of your books and I think that the, and the sort of the subsequent discussions, at least online in the agency world, seem to indicate that it's becoming more of a, a discussion and a topic. Well, I hope so. I think so. I mean, because I think creative as you know, at conferences in particular, um, has taken a bit of a back seat. Uh, and you rarely see an ad, you know, at a at an advertising conference. It's all about measurement. You know, it's we've become very scientific, haven't we? Um, about quantifying things rather than reflecting on their qualities, you know. Uh, and that and science has a, a tendency to reduce things, to look down on things and to make close up a bit like the left hemisphere, to break them up into smaller parts. And actually advertising's role is is to look out, you know, as the book suggests, and connect with people, you know in in the you know the general public. Um it's more like a you know it's got more in common than theater than it has with science in my view, you know, mm, that's fascinating. And, that's, and that, and that is, um, you know, that's, that's why I think this is so important. And, uh, 
yeah. So I, I, so your next question was about AI, right? And, um, well, heavens, uh, it's obviously it's going to be the thing that people are talking about an awful lot, isn't it? And it does have um, the potential to change uh, the world uh, enormously, and also in a world that's barely got to grips with the new digital technologies that are around us, right? Um, you know, uh, seeks to seeks to um, you know, cause even greater confusion, I think, you know, what is real and what isn't real. Um, how, I'm sure creative agencies, I know they're looking at it and using it in ca- in some cases. Um, I wonder whether, uh, I think Tom Roach, I, I believe it was Tom Roach who said this, so sorry, Tom, if you didn't, uh, but I think, you'd, I, think I, I heard you'd said this, um, said that, uh, you know, one of the good things about AI is that, you know, you can, you can, you can, plug your uh, kind of brief into it um, and it will give you the obvious things. And then, you know, those are the things, not what not to do, um, which I think is a lovely idea. If, if, if it's indeed a great uh, idea. Said that. So uh, thank you, Tom. Um, but um, uh, so, so I don't know. I think it, look, it can get you to things quite quickly that you, uh, to a pretty good level of finish, I think. Uh, but I just think it, it, at the moment it fundamentally misses the most important thing, which is lived human experience. And, uh, you know, it's sort of lived human experience by proxy, isn't it? But one step, remo- at least one step removed. And uh, it will always need, uh, I, I think, people to, um, can, can, you know, to, to, to connect it. I mean, it may be a useful, interesting starting point, but... Um, I think it might also, if you look at the way that AI, you look at art created by AI, and it looks a very strange thing, very dystopian, twisted, um, dark. um, And perhaps that's because of what's been fed into it. um, And maybe that's just the the modern... um, Right. The the modern uh, vibe. But, you know, it's... um, yeah, I think it's. Uh, I think it, it. I don't think it will really understands theatre. To back to my earlier point. Right, and, and I, I think theater. my broader thinking is it's goes back to the classic zag. You know, when everyone zigs, it's better to zag. And I, I suspect, mm. especially in marketing, what will become interesting in a generative AI world will be the opposite. I mean, I, that's just that just feels true of culture and I guess art generally speaking throughout time as you say sort of countercultures to culture and yeah yeah I think if everyone jumps that way then you know there's room for real um you know advertising with, with that has that that can display a sense of betweenness and connection um you know where something else you know so, something of real meaning um, that speaks of the experience of life will become um, important. Yeah. So um, I'd like to move on. To, I could literally sit and talk to you all day about this, but I am <laughs> very conscious of your time. So I thought we could move on to a quick fire round. Um, oh, and gosh. I'd like to start with um, what might be a tricky question. What is your favorite marketing campaign, Orlando, of all time? What's your personal <sighs> favorite? You know, it's, uh, it's really hard, isn't it, to, to choose these things? Uh, but you're going to make me do it, aren't you? Um, yeah. <laughs> well, look, one, one that I've often I often reference in my presentations is Heineken refreshes the parts that other beers cannot reach, um, and uh, I, I just think because it is a metaphor for something, and because it was done so playfully and so brilliantly, and the way that it evolved, you know, refreshes the poets that other beers cannot reach, you know. Um, uh, it was just so, uh, so clever. And, um, and, uh, the, and it had fun with itself as well. You know, I mean, there's, there's one with, um, an announcer saying, you know, I'm sorry to say, I, you know, do you like a good laugh? You know, I do. Well, I'm sorry to say, here's another Heineken commercial, um, type thing, you know? Um, so it, you know, it was self-aware. It knew that it was advertising. It was knew it was having fun. It treated the audience with respect. Um, it got the audience to fill in the gaps to get the joke. Uh, 
and there's so many lessons there, of course. Now, that's television advertising. I think you probably also want to reference at least uh, uh, because it was so influential, uh, the VW uh, campaign from by DDB. Um, because that uh, you know that that did all the things that that we've I think increasingly forgetting uh, about you know taking finding some magic in the product itself, uh, looking at it through the audience's eyes, um, doing something that none of the other people were doing at the same time. You know, so showing the car as short, uh, you know, rather than long. Um, you know, kind of uh, 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 talking in terms of ugliness rather than perfection, you know, uh, talking about um, how it never changed rather than, you know, the very latest um, gadget or, 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 you know, feature. Um, and did it with humor, you know, and, um, and it treat, and it also, the whole, the whole ad looked like a whole, you know, it's like the gestalt, the whole thing rather designed as a whole thing. It was kind of a letter rather than the product brochure, which is what everyone else was doing. So I think that is a really important campaign that we can still learn a lot from. And I think what's interesting about that is, so one of the questions I was going to get to before but didn't was because, yeah, you brought up this idea of TV being a very natural medium to, you know, have these more mm. maybe narrative, context-driven mm. stories because I guess you have, yeah, literally the the canvas to do that. And one of the things I was going to ask you was, you know, is it possible to do that level of right brain advertising in other mediums? And I think that, you know, that's a, a great example. Yeah. I think, you know, brilliant copy, whether it's brochures, billboards or yes. whatever. I mean, you know, I, I think I look at Oatly um, as an example and, you know, whether you like it or not, I think, you know, they very much feel like they're, they're – they bring humor, yeah. reverence, self awareness. I think they do that to a degree, yeah. which it, almost yeah. to the absurd level. Which it's is, sort think, of a, a, a knowing wink or a nod, isn't it? You know, you know, you know what we're up to here. Yeah. That's the sort of tone of voice that uh, uh, you know. You've got to let the audience in on the joke, let them know that you know, type thing. You know, that this is to create that connection. And in so in TV advertising. I mean, in any advertising, you have to be more interesting or entertaining than the than the content or, or programming that surrounds it. That's an um, interesting idea. Uh, so, so you know, on TV, you have to be definitely have to be more entertaining than the things that are around it. And in you know, in uh, print advertising, you've got to be more interesting than the printed word uh, around it, and and more visually arresting. You know, um, in in with billboards, you've got to have uh, you know, you've got to be, create a kind of, as Ogilvy, David Ogilvy put it, a visual scandal. You know, you've got to create something that's going to, you know, really stand out against the environment. And that, that is, um, that's a, those are, I think, important principles to abide mm. by. Yeah, that's brilliant. I think those, all of those examples. And um, I guess the other one I'd just mention um because I spoke to Jamie from McCann the other day, was yeah. the, 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 of course, the classic gene-like uh, brands. Oh, yes. Uh, only cheaper, the sort of the... Yes, yes, I don't like, yes. I don't like tea, I like gin. I mean, that's no, just... That, that's right, that's right. Well, look, I work, we work with Jamie and I know Jamie very well. Um, and we've had, you know, like to say we've, we've helped, I think he would say we've helped uh, System One um, to, in the development of the, particularly the Kevin the Carrot, advertising yep. and creating character um and you know making sure that it's sort of well as successful as it is you know it's kind of a, as entertaining as um well, more entertaining than most <laughs> most other uh christmas ads and, and in the uk and that's and uh, the, i get and the you know the proof is in the pudding i mean the you know i i a yeah. little plug so um a couple of episodes before this, I did speak to Jamie and we dug into Kevin and um, yeah. all the success they've had. So definitely go and listen to yeah, that absolutely. already. Um, so Orlando, the name of this show is Own the Moment, which I guess for us is this idea of really sort of, I, I guess, an encapsulation of everything we've talked about today. How do you sort of, you're right, how do you rise above and sort of earn and win attention in any moment, whether it's sitting on the sofa, you know, walking the aisles of the supermarket or, you know, driving down the, the motorway. Mm. Um, what to you is the best example of a brand that you've seen sort of own a moment? Oh, wow. You know, these are, that, that's a, 
The best example brand that's owned the moment. Um, you've, you've, uh, that's a good question. And, uh, I think, you know, there are a few examples that sort of perhaps we could talk about. I mean, I think, I think McDonald's has been doing quite a nice job, um, recently and the recent ad was, um, with a sort of office workers going out for McDonald's, you know, um, was very interesting. And, uh, the eyebrows and the the music, of course. Right. It really is about seizing the moment. That whole ad, in fact, when you think about it, owning the moment. Um, and uh, I think this there was something theatrical, uh, sort of performance uh, about the whole thing, which I think, and of course, referencing the f- the film. I think Ferris Bueller. You know. Um, I think that was that was that was worth a you know worth a mention. Um, so I think that was quite quite a nice a recent and con- fairly contemporary um, mm. example. I mean, I think I think uh, Mars's brands have been very yeah. good for years. You know, um, and consistently good uh, Snickers. You're not you when you're hungry. Um, the M and M's characters. You know, Maltesers. They've all they've all done. Um, entertaining and consistently good work with an idea really at the, at the, at the heart of them um, or a character, you know, a set of characters at the heart of them. So I think they're worth, uh, worth a mention. And um, yeah, I think I th- also, in the, I mean, in the UK, uh, I think Yorkshire tea is, is also worth a, worth a mention too, for its long running idea, you know, and this exaggeration to almost to comic lengths of, you know, the extent to the, the lengths to which they go to give you a proper cup of tea. You know, I think that's uh, brilliant. Uh, it reminds me of something, <clears throat> excuse me. I know Mark Ritson has said before, I can't remember where I heard it, but this idea of um, brands give up on an idea too quickly and mm. I think there's, you know, right, there's something valuable in that idea of the, the longevity of an idea and that an mm. idea, you know, a, a small creative idea, you know, it can grow in both effectiveness and yeah. all of the other things that we'd like to measure with, you know. It, it can. It can it can evolve. Uh, right. And, and often it, it does, it might not, you might not get there immediately. You know, it might take a little time to evolve into something, you know, that really finds its feet. Um but often it you'll you'll find it wears out in the boardroom more quickly than it does with the general public. And, See, that's uh, interesting. That, th- yeah, I think well, that, that's extremely interesting. Um, like because it sounds obvious, but I you know I don't think it is actually that obvious to people. It, it's I think it's often the case, and you know also you'll get a new uh, CMO coming in <laughs> wanting to change things probably, so uh, put their mark on the whole thing. So the, this. And that's one of the things I talk about in Lemon, actually, and um, yep. is that I describe it as the fluent device, but the long-running ca- character or the long-running scenario. Um, some some of those we just mentioned with Mars, Yorkshire Tea, are exactly that. And uh, how more effective? You know, they're much more effective. They're easier to recognise. They, um, uh, you know, tend to be character-based in some way. So they they. they they capture the attention of the right hemisphere. They lodge things in memory. They're emo- more emotional, um, and they can reduce price sensitivity and uh, result in greater share and likelihood of share and profit gain. So, um, the, the, but they've been disappearing, you know, all the while in this technological age. You know, characters disappear. And things become yeah. more mechanistic. But, so, but it, it is funny, and you know, I'm sort of quite new to this world, and you know, this show is about me diving into it because there's something to me that I know is wrong as I've been doing the research. But there's something about like whether it's the Energizer Bunny or the M and M's characters that it feels outdated as a tool. But of course, you know, all of the research, you know, and you guys have been a a big part of that tells you that it's the opposite, right? But it's funny, isn't it? And, you know, maybe it's just me, but I get the sense that, you know, it probably isn't just me because as you say, brands are moving away from mascots, characters um, in favor of this more sort of, you know, flat Hmm. devitalized left brain advertising. Hmm. And it's, you know, coming into this world, I definitely, you know, my, my, um, if you'd asked me, 
you know, I would, yeah, that feels like that's that's an old school tactic. Um, but of course, it well, shouldn't we have be. This, but when you get periods like the one I think we're in, um, there is this very uh, this often this often happens, you know, this desire to trash the past, right, and and to say that you know, well, that's no longer relevant, you know. And that's actually something, the left brain is not very good at um, understanding the past, its own past, its own connection with the body and the history. Um, and the, the left brain often thinks it knows best um, when it doesn't most of the time. It doesn't know what it doesn't know. And um, and so you end up, so so you do tend to get this. And it's often something that people say to me, you know, is, oh, why are you looking back at these old ads? Well, because that's what great artists do, you know. I mean, that without without um, Mantegna, Veronese, you know, the great artists of the Renaissance, there would be no Rembrandt. Rembrandt studied these artists and incorporated their thinking in his own brilliant painting. Right, and we still and, listen to the Beatles and the Stones. Yeah, and, and, and actually, you know, what, in periods periods I think which are a bit devitalized, like the one we're in, you actually need to look back at what's gone before to give you the energy and the light really to move forward. And I think that's a, you know, we, we need to build on what we know rather than, you know, assume that it was all wrong. Yeah. Uh, because and because I think that that's an important point because it, it's not that, you know, right. We should look back and, you know, just redo what, you know, of course you can yeah. innovate. Um, yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, to move away from advertising for a moment, I think music is the ultimate example of that, right? Where sort of, you know, um, you know, looking back and then mixing that with, you know, maybe more contemporary mm. Mm. inspiration can, you know, launch entirely new genres and yeah. styles. And I think, you know, yeah. the same, of course, will be and is true in advertising and I guess yes. all forms of creativity yes. as well. Yes, that's right. That's right. And it's it's funny, isn't it, how music captures the spirit of a period and you can actually hear the energy of that period in the music. Right. Um, much like painting, actually, but music in particular. Because music yeah, that, is all about life and movement, and that's um, so that that that's how it how it does it. Yeah, we we didn't get to music and advertising today. No, very um, but maybe well, we'll have to yeah. have a round two because I think the yeah. jingle and um, the role of music in both of these left and right brain forms of advertising would be really interesting. Um, so my next question is, what's the most overrated trend in marketing and advertising right now? Oh, goodness. Uh, well, um, yeah, I suppose AI, we've talked a bit about AI. We'll, we'll have to see where that goes. Um, um, but, um, yeah, I think I, that, that, I mean, I, I do talk a little bit, of, I don't go into it in too much detail, in look out but um purpose advertising i mean it depends how you define purpose doesn't it but um you know has been on the rise you know if you look at um the awards that are given uh for campaigns in in can and at the same time humor you know humorous campaigns have been falling from the awards you know uh tables um, you don't see them so much anymore, and that um, I think that that worries me because because purpose advertising tends tends to be um, well it can be quite worthy, you know, um, and it doesn't always connect with broad audiences, and uh, you know, you, there there are ways I think of doing it that. You know, you can. Why couldn't you, as I say in the book, you know, why couldn't it be, why can't it be more humorous? Why can't it be done with humor, wit and charm? Um, because I think that it can. I think Maltesers have sort of done that um, quite well. So I think, uh, you know, there's a, that, that's, that's an interesting trend. And, um, uh, and, you know, if you were to ask me, you know, well, what aren't we talking about enough? Um, uh, which maybe you are, um, you know, I, I'd, I'd say, well, I don't think we're talking about humor enough. I don't think we're doing it enough. And it's a very effective creative approach. Um, it's, it's not just, um, a way of connecting with the audience. By the way, Jeremy, the late Jeremy Bullmore once said to me, you know, laughter is a, 
a sign that a connection has been made. And he's, he's absolutely right. He's absolutely yeah. right on that. Yeah, I was discussing, um, um, uh, I'm sure you saw Oatley's spam newsletter campaign. Oh, right. Yes. That was yes. big. And um, I will have Kevin Lynch from Oatley, uh, who was behind that campaign on the show soon. Um, and anyway, I was talking to one of my friends who works in advertising and he, you know, I, I was asking her, you know, what do you think? And, and just um, for those who haven't seen it, it was, you know, they had this newsletter, which feels like an utterly bizarre thing to uh, promote on billboards in Times Square, by the way, and I guess that's part of that is mm. part of the humour. Have humor. some fun with the with the medium. I often say, yeah. yeah but but and the copy, I just, I mean, the copy was brilliant. Um, so you know, they have this one billboard in Times Square, and it says, you know, what would be more? Uh, oh, I can't think of it. You know, what would be crazier than um, uh, renting a billboard in Times Square to promote a newsletter? And then in the in the background, there's a second billboard and another building that says, you know, buying two. And I, I mean. <laughs> It's, it's just brilliant. And anyway, this agency friend of mine, he said, you know, I mean, right, this exactly to what you said. He said, you know, to make someone smile, you know, mm. maybe not even laugh, but just smile mm. is such a powerful, yeah. right, it's evidence of connection. And the I think been there, going yeah. back to own the moment, I think for me, that's one of the things that I very much think about is, right, if you can elicit some sort of emotional response. Yeah. And I guess, yeah. you know, the opposite going back to purpose, you know, sadness or, um, uh, maybe even guilt um you know I'm, i guess that is an equally strong emotional response um it is um but in in brand building terms uh it's better to leave people feeling uh either good about you or that they there's something they can do about it right that's um, interesting you know so uh you know it's good to it, in terms of the ways you know we tend to remember positively associated uh, events, you know, more longer than we do negative ones, um, unless they're really bad. Um, and that, you know, it's important in advertising to make people feel good, to charm them and to make them feel, feel, you know, you, you're, you're invading their space in some way. So, you know, the least you can do is to be, is, uh, to leave them feeling a little bit better about things. So, you know, there's, a, you've got to have a sense of humor, a sense of charm, hope, um, all of those things. But I was going to say that the other thing that humor does um, is that, you know, because of the way it works, it's often about, you know, inverting things or um, turning things up, turning things upside down or, um, you know, repetition or exaggeration. We talked about Yorkshire tea earlier. It actually gives you a way of creating a long running campaign. You know, it's just it's a, it, it's it's, you know, it's something that can structure a campaign, give structure to a campaign, to an idea, you know, um, it's a, it's a kind of, it's also a metaphor that can, you know, help you, help you, um, communicate something about your product, the virtue of your product. You know, we go to extreme lengths to dot, 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 right. You know, your exaggeration. So I think it's, it's, it's more than just about connecting with in the ad. It can help you to shape a whole campaign and, uh, you know, we, I think we ignore it at our, at our peril and at our loss. Yeah, and I, I can't help but feel it, it, it must say something about the time that we're living in. I mean, of course, we've dug into this whole idea of the left brain sort of dominating the not just advertising but the culture. But, you know, I guess tying back to humour or the lack of humour um, and maybe the rise of social purpose, it may, you know, is there a sense that, you know, we're in um, – I don't know, um, are we in particularly sort of dire times or whatever, you know, I don't know, with everything from um, the war in the Ukraine to climate mm. change and um, mm. the recession yes. and everything else. And I wonder if there's this, yeah, this sort of, um, if some of that gloom has sort of seeped into oh, creativity. Totally. You know, I mean, advertising does not exist in a vacuum. It It is a barometer for what's going on around. It reflects the world and it kind of also leads the conversation as well you know it's sort of a bit of both and you know you see it i mean if you if you read look out you know i'd go into this in some detail you actually see it in the ads you know and it some of the the ads in, in actually in look out i talk about how they even look like some of the art from the 1500s following the, the invention of the printing presses um, and also the early 20th century, um, you know, before the Great War and everything that followed, you know, really tense, anxious 
fearful time um, when new technologies sort of upend the world. And you, you know, you, you see it in the art of those periods, you know, the solemnity of the art of the Reformation, the flatness, the words on the canvas, you know, um, pretty much like advertising today. And that, uh, the art, you know, the art of a period tells you something of, of the psyche of the period. And that, I think that's true for advertising. And that's fascinating. So last question, Orlando, who is the most interesting marketeer in the world? Right now. Grief. Uh, most interesting marketeer in the world right now. Um, Who's doing the most interesting work? A, maybe is another a, a way to practi- a practitioner. Um, you, you you mean uh, yeah? Um, well, I gave the example of uh, McDonald's a minute ago. I think that was quite, that was that was interesting. That was good. Um, I do like the Yorkshire Tea uh, campaign. Um, I think uh, the Mars stable has been very good. I do like the uh, work the Warburtons have been doing, in fact, as well, um, with, with their... Uh, so from an advertising point of view, those are some of the examples. I think Specsavers uh, have, for many years, done some brilliant work, uh, and I think they're, they're doing some really nice things. So uh, there are uh, some, some wonderful uh, precedents and examples uh, still uh, out there and um and you know uh, hats off to them and uh i hope uh, you know i hope hope others uh, uh as inspired by them as i am mm. i think that's a nice optimistic take to end on um i absolutely recommend everyone go and read both lemon and look out um and orlando thank you so much for being on the show absolute pleasure james lovely chatting Thanks for listening to the On The Moment podcast. If you liked this episode, make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss upcoming episodes. And to suggest a guest or provide feedback, please visit our dedicated podcast hub at ownthemomentpod.com 